Well, um, Pete, thanks for helping me with my project. So can you tell me what this, this project really is for? Is this for work or for? Completely a personal endeavor. Just, I was literally walking around during uh, Christmas holidays and um, I was like, hey, uh, we're landing people on the moon in 2024. And wouldn't it be cool if I interviewed a different random person every day? Because originally I was talking to people in um, coffee shops, so I can't really do that anymore. Uh, <laughs> so now, I, now I'm interviewing less random people, but uh, still keeping up with it. But um, yeah, I, basically I work from home. So it was meant as a way to kind of counteract social distancing, um, okay. to force me to get out of my house and talk to another human person in person. So, okay. Uh, but um, in addition to that, I, I thought it'd be a good way to kind of uh, get people's views on something a little bit uh, deeper, um, like the future of humanity, as an example. <laughs> All right. So, I guess to start off with, uh, could you maybe introduce yourself? Well, I'm Peter Craney. I'm a IT project manager and a certified scrum master. That's a PMI, PMT. And uh, was back in school for nursing until about two years ago when that didn't work out for me and I withdrew from the program. And I started looking for work again uh, about a year and a half ago and have not been successful. And now I don't know that I ever will be. <laughs> with the uh with the downturn in the economy and everything i have, i mean i definitely know you and uh, you have a lot of uh enviable skills uh so um i think it's just about getting you in front of the right people <laughs> well yeah that's that's problematic now because you don't get to actually be in front of the right people you get screened out increasingly by applicants uh, applicant tracking systems and you don't actually get to talk to a person even if you know somebody in a company and you try to network your way in it has become increasingly difficult to follow that path because they intercept your calls and um, you have to go back to the applicant tracking system and put in an online application and then HR takes over mostly with AI uh, screening out applicants rather than screening in applicants as an example I have a friend Andy and uh, he's a product manager, and uh, he was a 96% match according to the HR people, but the hiring manager would only talk to 100% matches. So he asked them, well, how long has this position been open? They said three years. So obviously there's not a lot of urgency, and there's not a lot of reality checking on the availability of 100% matched candidates if they haven't found one in three years. And this is for a big, industries um that he, use he was a product manager at uh well goes back to compaq and then hp hpe and uh was furloughed i think he said about eight months ago that's about how long i've known him so. hmm. uh, would you consider moving um i would i would i'm actually considering moving anyway i uh I'm old enough where I can consider myself semi-retired. Uh, I'd like to work maybe not as uh, arduous or vigorous a job as I've had in the past, um, but the um, western part of South Carolina appeals to us. It's close to my sister-in-law, but not too close. You know what I mean? <laughs> right, right. I, you want to be close enough to have uh, common events without too much effort, but not so close that you're constantly in each other's way. I think it would be like five or six hour drive, five hour drive probably between the two places. So yeah, mm -hmm. see them on weekends, things like that. Like between here and Dallas. Yeah, similar. So a uh, nursing, that's uh, different. Well, um, it was uh, a way that I thought I could get back. Um, I, I ran into an ethical dilemma with uh, the director of our nursing program and ended up withdrawing from the program over it. Um, just couldn't understand her logic and decision making and uh, withdrew. And of course, I, I could have gone to a different school, but it would have been a longer program. 
and I would have been 64 by the time I sat for the nursing exam. And at that point, the payback's really not there now. I wasn't really doing it for a big payback, but I was doing it for something that seems to be a reliably secure job. Always need nurses. So, and, and to go on with that, my, uh, in my family, I have several people in the healthcare uh, roles. I have a nephew who's a doctor of physical therapy, a uh, niece who is a nurse practitioner, a, another niece, her, their sisters, um, who is a uh, licensed speech therapist in New York uh, with, I don't know how many different specializations. She deals with people of all ages and uh, developmentally disabled to recuperating from strokes, you know, the full gamut of people that are learning how to, how to communicate again. Yeah, I think uh, strokes are, I, I think maybe strokes aren't more frequent, but maybe strokes are less deadly uh, and people are living with them. I'm that living much longer after strokes now. Uh, I know several people myself, at least a half a dozen that have had strokes and are, are living normal lives now. They take more medications, they see their doctors more often, but they're not completely disabled like I remember stroke victims when I was a kid if they lived through it they were wheelchair bound and drooled all the time so <laughs> it's not like that anymore they have all these um, clock buster drugs that if they get them to you within two hours it's it's pretty amazing in fact I interviewed a person who had a, a stroke that made her so she couldn't talk uh, for this project and until halfway through the um, program when she was uh, described herself as being uh, brain damaged. I had no clue that she had recovered from that. Yeah, it's pretty amazing. Uh, and then uh, Gabrielle Giffords, uh, the one that, you know, the, um, I think it's uh, the New Mexico um, representative that had gotten shot in the head. Right. Uh, and she's the, uh, you know, the, the wife of one of the astronaut twins, you know, the, the one that spent the year in space. Um, yes, I know that. She's, she's married. And I mean, she's made a remarkable recovery uh, from that. So even looking at, you know, just kind of, I mean, that's, I mean, it's like a stroke, you know. Um, yeah, it was brain damage by uh, an event that occurred in their life. And yes, yeah, a, a gunshot wound, uh, so, you know, a blow to the head with a blunt object, all of these things damage the brain. What the, what the neuroscientists have learned is there's a lot more plasticity in brain tissue than they previously thought. It can relearn uh, almost anything that you learn growing up, you know, going through your formative years. Um, so that's hopeful for the future that people won't suffer from uh, Alzheimer's or dementia or any of those other things, if they can figure out how to make the brain regenerate or stop degenerating. Uh, unfortunately, they can't do anything about the uh, myelin sheath de degradation that happens in some people where they lose muscle control because the nerves no longer fire properly. Um, ALS, that's my sister, my oldest sister passed away from ALS a few years ago. Hmm. And uh, you know, that, that was a, be a great frontier, but uh, there's been documentaries and research done on it, going back to, I think, of the first major movie that dealt with that topic, was Lorenzo's Oil, where he was dealing with myelin sheath degeneration. I forget what disease he had, but it was one of those neurodegenerative diseases. Anyway, I'm off on topic. <laughs> well, you know, on one hand, you look at these people that are able to recover from significant brain damage and then you look at our own capability to learn to solve problems to recognize things and you think wow why why can't I create a training program for myself that allows for me to significantly improve the capabilities here you know I mean well well you can there's there's no question that doing uh, brain exercise, uh, common things like jigsaw puzzles or doku, um, or 
I don't want to go to neurocognitive conditioning because that's all been pretty much debunked. It's not as true science. It's a, it's a little superstition science. Uh, but you know, the, the way the brain forms habits uh, for mannerisms or anything else applies to thought processes too. And you can build a habit to study or to uh, improve your brain capacity and your ability to think. The, the hardest thing for people to do if they want to learn is to just be quiet and listen because I think it was Confucius that said, you know, when we speak, we're just repeating what we already know. When we listen, we have the opportunity to learn new. So you need to expose yourself to those opportunities. Yeah. It's, yeah, I mean, another way, it kind of unrelated, but I often think experience is like the best teacher. Yeah. But whenever people are giving you advice, it's sort of like talking in class and you can't actually hear the teacher. <laughs> I often think about that with my, my little nephew, you know, it's like, uh, just let him make the mistakes, make the observation, you know, wait for this, you know, the flash of lightning, and that will be way more effective than like any feedback I can give him. Um, That's true in many, many ways. And, uh, sometimes uh, lightning strikes are not as often as you would like. So, so where are you now? What are you doing these days? I work for a software company called Anaplan. It's based in, it was started out in York, UK. Uh, so I always have to specify that because you say York and people are like, oh yeah, over there in New York, yeah. But uh, no, it's actually, you know, two mile train, I mean, two hour train trip north of uh, London. Um, and it's now based in San Francisco and we just went, we had an IPO like, uh, I think almost two years ago at this point. Um, and I actually came in contact with Anaplant at HP when we started doing uh, like the sales comp project and they had brought in the product here. And then due to personal reasons, my, I moved to New Hampshire and, you know, we were having this, you have to be on site location, you know, and so I couldn't stay at HP anymore. So then I went over to this other company and been there for the past uh, five and a half years. So. Still in New Hampshire? Uh, I actually, you know, once we endured one New Hampshire winter with all that <laughs> white stuff coming down, we ran back to Texas. Okay. I, I grew up in upstate New York, so I know all about that white stuff. Yeah, it doesn't go anywhere. It's unlike flooding where you're like, in a week, we're over it. <laughs> no, it's different. It's a different animal, yes. Uh, you could easily, I mean, have piles and piles of white stuff for three, four or five months. Oh, yeah. I mean, you kind of have to plan on how you're going to stack it up just in case. <laughs> yeah. My favorite was always, you know, you clear the driveway, you go in to take a shower to go to work because the roads have been, and then the plow comes by again and you got two feet of slushy ice at the foot of your driveway again. Oh, and that's worse. I mean, it's like solid. It's not like the snow. Oh. You can't use a snow thrower and and it's really heavy and hard on your back to shovel. And uh, when it starts melting on the roofs of the house and you get the ice dam and then you have the, the leaking inside the house, all very weird experiences for a Texan. <laughs> yeah. Well, my first flood here in Texas was a weird experience for me having grown up and spent most of my life in the Northeast. So goes both ways but i have to shovel the heat down here yes the heat is awful but uh you know you just kind of become desensitized to it a little bit yeah. yeah um so did you know that nasa was planning to land people on the moon in 2024 i did and I did. how did you find out about it uh, it was some new site um, maybe a year ago i was just browsing news stories and they were talking about going back to the moon and uh, concrete plans to actually do it now. So I, I can't cite a specific source. Now, since the beginning of December, or now the middle of December till now, I've done about 150 interviews. Of those 150, would you like to venture a guess how many of them had known we were going to the moon in 2024? 
Well, I, I bet you had a few of them that said we've never been there before. Oh, yes, I've had like three or, or four of those. those. Those were interesting discussions. I'm going to guess that only about half of the general population is aware of this. Um, so somewhere around 50%. Yeah, it was about uh, 20 out of that 150. So that's only, uh, what, 30%? 30, 30 no. 20 out of 150? 20 out of 150. So I think that comes out to be what about, I was, so 10% uh, would have been 15. So it's a little bit over 10%. Okay. Wow. So maybe 12. Uh, little... Yeah. In fact, I talked to one person. They're like, uh, why are they keeping it a secret? <laughs> I, I was like they're not trying to you know but i think a lot of it uh, has to do with how individualized our news is um you know if if you show some interest in space or science or exploration you know you might see a pop-up in your news feed but if you've never i mean just like you're saying to the ai um you know about the the applicant pool the same thing's happening with our news sources too. We get a completely almost perfected reinforcing feed of information. That's right. And I think that's a, a disservice to, to us as individuals. I wish that we would have almost random access to the news like uh, print media used to be. Now, print media wasn't all of the stories that could be told, but... Um, the days of newspapers when they were inexpensive, you would read the headlines and know what stories you wanted to see and you'd read them all if you wanted to. Now you don't even have the option to know all of the headlines that are out there. Yeah, at least to provide a foundation for conversation. Um, right. You know, you'd be, you'd be like, well, why didn't they cover this? And why are they talking about this? And now it's like, uh, you run into somebody, you want to talk about the news and you're like, what are you reading? You know, <laughs> it's like. Well, uh, journalism itself, I think, has has taken a turn towards infotainment rather than true journalism uh, in the last twenty years. Um, I remember, like Tom Brokaw, Walter Cronkite, where they reported the news, and it was not all of this what you should think about it or what we think about it or what this means. It was what happened. It was the who, what, when, where, why, and. Uh, it was up to you to figure out what it meant for you, if it meant anything. So they're telling us what to think now rather than telling us what happened. And I don't think that's right. And it's not just one thing. I mean, you have like the person talking, then you have like the little sidebar on the side with like some additional news and then stuff at the bottom and then like the sound effects. Yeah. I mean, the changing numbers that make you draw your attention to a particular story that they want you to think about or hear their take on. Yeah, it's, uh, it's, not, it's not really free media, it's controlled media. But, and, um, you know, I, I was talking to my, uh, my cousin's children, uh, the 13, eight, ranges eight to 13, and, um, you know, they hadn't heard about us going to the moon either. And I was like, well, you know, Elon Musk, uh, who's he? I was like, well, he has a car company called Tesla. And they were like, uh, well, why would we know that? We can't drive. And then we got to talking a little bit more. And I was like, uh, you know, what should they do? They're like, they should advertise more. And so I thought I'd probe a little bit into that. And I was like, well, what was the last advertisement you remember? And they said, Liberty Mutual, which I thought was kind of funny considering the car <laughs> comment from earlier. <laughs> yeah, but Liberty Mutual. <laughs> It uses the, the disconnected graphical, you know, the, the, what is it, an ostrich or an emu? It's an emu. Okay. I mean, they have eye candy in their advertising that appeals to most people. It doesn't have anything to do with the product they're selling. Hmm. Yeah, it's like, um, what, what's the name of that gasoline station? Uh, Bucky's with the beaver. It's like... It has absolutely nothing to do with uh, wildlife of any type, I hope. Just clean bathrooms. <laughs> well, that's their whole, that's their corporate mantra. You know, we have the cleanest bathrooms in the world, for cleanest public bathrooms in the world. That's why they were founded. You know, their, their founder was tired of stopping at truck stops on trips with his family and being disgusted or scared to let them use the, the restrooms. 
Uh, indeed. I mean, it's been, I know from Houston, San Antonio, I love stopping, stopping at that Bucky's over there. It's like huge. I think I've thought the, the one in Katy that has the world's largest car wash now. It's in, uh, I haven't you? seen that. Oh, yeah. They, uh, they went through their certification with uh, the world record book, uh, Guinness, and they're in there now. So I, I don't know. I think they're classified as the longest automated car wash, not necessarily the largest, because someplace in Europe, there's one that's multi-story. I don't know how that works, but. Is it, does it, multiple cars go through it at a time, or, I mean? I don't really, I've never gone through it, so I just, I know that it made the news here in Houston when it went, uh, it went online, and the people from Guinness were in town. That's, uh, that's interesting, but, you know, one of the justifications for going to the moon and landing people there is to create, to inspire the next generation and what have you. I don't see how it could inspire anybody if they don't know about it. So that's a good point. And considering the way news is given to us, what are some tools that you think NASA and space advocates should be looking at in order to kind of. Well, they could, that's, a, I don't know, I wasn't prepared for that question at all. Um, if they put together a program on NASA, like on BBC America or uh, uh, the public PBS, that would reach part of the market, but I don't know that they could ever get um, mainstream networks to run a program like that. Uh, I, I, growing up, I remember when there was launches, you know, people would be glued to their television screens as a family watching it. You know, now getting a family together to do anything is, uh, is kind of rare. So I don't, I don't know that we'll ever have that kind of cultural experience where everybody is excited about the same thing again. But to get them to just be aware of it, uh, some sort of a program about NASA's future, NASA's projects in, included in network broadcast. I don't know if they would have to buy it as commercials um, or do a documentary about, or I don't know, is that the right word, a documentary when you're talking about the future of an agency? I, mm. I guess it could be, it depends on how it's outlined, I, I suppose. Well, you know, there was a, you know, the, the story about the mathematicians that uh, made it to uh, the, th the main theaters last year, the uh, African-American women mathematicians that worked at NASA. Uh, hidden figures. That was it. I, I uh, couldn't remember the name of it. But, you know, that kind of makes people aware that this happened in the past. Maybe if they would, you know, buy a trailer for the movie before or after that or put it on the DVDs or the streaming services um, associated with movies like that um, that might get more general public awareness. I don't know. What do you think we should do? Um, you know, the, but personally, I, I think libraries are going to be where I'm going to focus some attention because do you already have people coming there from a broad cross section, um, you know, that have interest in various things. So I was thinking about trying to create some exhibits for like library uh, entry places or lobbies. Um, for example, next summer, there's a Houston company, Intuitive Machines, that's landing a, a probe on the moon. Uh, and I was thinking, what about putting a mock-up of their probe inside of the the library and then you could you know people are like whoa what's this thing and then uh you could have some information about our journey back to the moon yeah well doesn't musk also want to go to mars uh, yes yes he does in fact you know in boca chica he's working on building uh what he's calling now the starship it's a uh, hundred percent reusable spacecraft uh, and it's going to be able to lift something like 100 tons into orbit. So it'd be the most powerful spacecraft ever built, but the cheapest per launch, because all they have to do is 
inspect it, refurbish it, and refuel it. And he's not so trading. How, oh, go how ahead. Many it's gonna, how many flights do you think he'll get from one? I, I mean, I think he's thinking of hundreds, actually. He's talking it's, about the same craft being able to launch it three times a day. The same one? The same one. Holy mackerel, that's incredible. Yeah, I mean, that's that's aspirational, he admits, but uh, that's sort of where his head's at. And he's talking about uh, building a factory that can produce two of these a week. Two a week. So in a year, you'd have 100 of them going. That's like th what, 300 trips a day at the end of a year. Yeah, Is it's that a orbit. I mean, how much fuel production do they have to do to support something like that? Is it going to be hydrogen and, and uh, oxygen engines or? Uh, methane oxygen. Methane oxygen? Yeah. And uh, methane, uh, conceivably, you get from carbon dioxide and hydrogen. Right. Uh, so you could almost uh, kind of recycle it if you uh, had the right setup. Yeah. It's, uh, it's going to take a lot of fuel just to move that mass into orbit. So, I mean, you'd have to generate a lot of fuel in a local geography, on a pretty accelerated timeline. I don't know that, I don't know that that technology is available today, let alone the spacecraft. Um, you know, maybe there's uh, an opportunity there for us. <laughs> maybe, <laughs> maybe. But uh, this, you know, Boca Chica is right next to Brownsville, just to help um, put it in on the map um, but um, he's actually plans to have an orbital test flight this year uh, so it's like not just like powerpoint and what have you and there's like cameras set up by third parties that are like constantly streaming the developments that they have and there's like all these uh, kind of podcasters who are closely following and updating on on his progress it's it's really interesting i I didn't know that he was, I didn't know about that part of the project that he, that he has in his mind. And I had no idea that he was planning a test launch an orbital flight this year. No idea. The amazing thing is this is sort of like people knowing about single passenger airplanes and talking to them about the 747. It's just like, the, the transformation between those two crafts and what they all created is just almost, you almost have to see it to believe it. Yeah. But, you know, just imagining a couple of years from now, our view about what is and isn't possible may be fundamentally shattered. Uh, well, I hope that we learn things that I haven't even thought of. I hope that we experience those things in our lifetime. As a as a race as a planet. Uh, did you do you know about any uh, big news later this month regarding space and astronauts and? I do not. I, so if I read anything or seen anything, it's slipped from my memory. So the last time the U.S. was capable of launching astronauts into space was the last flight of the space shuttle in 2011. Right. Uh, since then, Boeing and SpaceX have been working on developing, um, you know, commercially owned uh, spacecraft that NASA would just buy brides on. And on May 27th, SpaceX is actually launching two astronauts from Florida for the first time since 2011 to the Inter International Space Station. I did not know that. Which is, which is amazing. You know, we're finally, and you can actually buy a ride on uh, the SpaceX thing. Finance is not constrained. Yes, I could. <laughs> yeah. uh, I, uh, take a ride. I don't know. But uh, what do you think about us uh, going to the moon in 2024? I mean, do, do you see that as being like a good thing, something that is a good foundation for the future? Or, or do you think it's like a misguided priorities? Or what are your thoughts? I think that uh, programs that focus on technology and bring technology manufacturing and technology industrial jobs back to the U.S. soil is good for the country. 
uh, I look back at NASA, I remember the, the landing, uh, how many years ago that was, I was a kid. Um, and how much that invigorated the manufacturing economy in the US. Not only that, there was technical innovation that uh, occurred at such a pace during that time, I think largely because of what was going on with the space program um, that we haven't seen since. And I think Elon Musk and all these other uh, initiatives are putting the technology development back on the front burner, back important to our survival. I think that's a good thing. Um, but I don't think most people are aware of that. And I don't think we are academically prepared as a country for that. I don't think we have the engineering talent and uh, the engineering, uh, the innovative thinkers uh, as widely spread throughout our country as we used to. I think a lot of them are overseas now because that's where the investments have been happening. So. Well, well, and also, I mean, it, it feels like back in the 60s, the technology itself was what everybody was focused on. And it feels like now in terms of our whole education system and everything, it's all around credentials and status and, you know, looking like you know, as opposed to actually knowing. <laughs> right. The, the engineers that put men on the moon were working with... Uh, tape drives if they had them, and slide rules most of the time, manual controls, relay controlled uh, circuitry. You know, today it's all microchip and um, the people that write the instruction sets don't know what it's being used for. The people that are uh, designing the use cases don't know what the technology is really capable of. They just, you know, somebody has to put it together. And I, I don't know, um, what it will take to get us back in sync between the capabilities, the, the visionaries, and uh, you know the nuts and bolts coders that are needed. You know, they didn't really have a lot of uh, IT people back in NASA back in those days. Um, speaking from my IT experience over the years, you know, I, I think we could have done a lot more had we the same technology now. You know, calculations that would take them weeks with you know pencil and paper and slide rule we could do in seconds now with uh, not even a main you know not even a, a big server just a normal average pc so i don't know it's interesting yeah it it really is um i also wonder sometimes if the cheapness of calculation and cheapness of communication means that maybe we're not prior to, uh, prioritizing as much what really is essential whereas i mean they had to essentially prioritize every single thing they wanted to find out and do that's right and and now uh, so when i went to uh, college back in the dark ages and i took classes for computer science like fortran and uh, pl1 for uh, a univac you had to you're really efficient in your code. So in order to achieve those efficiencies, you mapped out in block form before you wrote your first line of code. Now people just like shotgun out the code and then fix the problems that they introduce in their code rather than knowing you know, a flow chart through the whole process and all of the, the failure points before they write their first line of code. So they've gotten, in, in my opinion, in a lot of ways, they've gotten sloppy about how they write code. Oh, indeed. And uh, you say write the first line of code. I, I wonder how much of it is uh, selective copy and pasting from Google search results. Oh, now? Oh, yeah. <laughs> tremendous amount. I'm, do I'm doing it myself sometimes. <laughs> yeah, me too. But, uh, you know, and you're like, well, it looks like it does what I need it to. I don't quite understand the syntax. Okay, on to the next thing. You know? uh, plug it in, see if it works. Close enough, move on. Right. I know it's like a house of cards though. You're like, hopefully the people with the, that wrote the OS didn't do that. Hopefully the people that wrote the bias didn't do that. But you know, at every level, it's, it's, it's the same methodology. Okay. Um, so um, uh, 500 years from now, uh, where do you hope humanity is? 
Well, um, have you ever watched the science fiction series, The Expanse? I have, yes. I hope that we are in a more civil version of our solar system uh, in 500 years than they portray in The Expanse, but just as poorly dispersed. Uh, in fact, I've met one of the Expanse uh, actors, uh, the uh, Texan Martian. Uh, you know, um, I, I've met him actually. Cool. <laughs> yeah. But I, I mean, that'd be cool. So in 500 years, you see us on the moon, on Mars, um, mining asteroids, building spacecraft on the moons of Jupiter, on the moons of Saturn. Yeah. I think it's completely possible in 500 years. Maybe sooner. I don't know. Um, do you think we'll actually be able to make it to another star system at some point? Before our sun dies, maybe. Mm -hmm. um, I have a hard time envisioning how we would travel those distances. You know, science fiction always uses these uh, cryogenic sleep chambers, and I don't know that that's realistic for human interstellar space travel. I don't think we would survive. Our technology would fail before we got to the next star system. Uh, I don't think the drives that we have today or can envision in the not too distant future could generate the velocities to get us there in a reasonable amount of time. So I don't know. I, I would like to say yes, but I'm very hesitant because I don't think, I don't think we can do it. I don't know that with, with what I think about our rate of development and technology, our rate of visionary thinking, I don't, I think it's in the cards right now. I've talked to some people that aren't so um, supportive of space exploration and what have you, and there, there's sort of a, two common things. One is we should be doing other things, like people, we should worry about the people that are starving on Earth and medical care and equality and the environment and stuff like that. And you know, I think that the counter to that's we could be doing everything. But the, the other thing is, uh, which I thought was kind of an interesting concept was um, not messing up space, you know, not messing up the moon. Like why would we go to the moon and mess up the moon like we did the earth? I was just wondering how you would respond to that. <laughs> well, I don't think, um, at least in early exploration and colonization of any extraterrestrial object, whether it be the moon or Mars or a moon of, Jupiter, it doesn't matter. Um, you don't have the luxury of having a lot of materials to just leave laying around. You have to bring things with an intent uh, and purpose and keep it in that service as long as possible. Um, so we can't just be going around throwing junk on the ground like we do to our highways here on Earth. Um, do I, do I, you know, to your first point, do I think we should go? Yes, I think we should go. And I think we also can do those other things. They aren't exclusive. Uh, they weren't exclusive in Kennedy's mind when he said we're going to the moon by the end of the decade. And he was also at the same time doing some great social program work. So he saw that the country could do both. And I think we still can do both. But we need to stop having all these partisan political fights that have nothing to do with the issues and go back to focusing on the issues and having true debate and statesmanship return to our government. Exactly. I mean, it almost seems like some type of uh, football game with screaming fans on each side trying to outshout the other as opposed to um, actually, hey, why don't we sit down and look at the many different faces of this policy and this problem and come together and figure out some way to address it. Talk about it. Let's talk about it. And, and people aren't willing to, this goes back to what I said about, you know, education and learning being the ability to learn. You need to listen in order to learn. And people go in with these preconceived notions, their own way of thinking, and they don't listen. They just, they don't listen to understand, they listen to respond. They want to be able to tear the other person apart rather than have a meaningful discussion about what are the underlying issues for any initiative? It almost seems like a good place to start is to create a forum, you know, start creating forums where people 
of different views can come together and discuss you know even if it was like just here and there you know um well, journalists used to do that there were programs like face the nation which uh in its at its inception was was debate between conflicting points of view and it has degraded into the jerry springer of news programs now yes where they're like talking over each other and out shouting and like you said responding yeah i don't like it i don't know there's things going on with um, broadcast media not associated with journalism or reporting of any kind like what's this fascination as a culture we have now with reality shows which are semi-scripted if not completely scripted um they're not allegories of our life that i don't know why people are fascinated by these and why they continue to watch them and make them year after year survivor 20 seasons that show has been on i know that because i see the commercials for it all the time what's the appeal and what's the value for our society about that well it's like the the whole wwf wrestling right i mean <laughs> yeah there are people that believe that that's all true, you know. But I, I yeah, I, I, apparently, uh, you know, the, some of the scripts got leaked, and uh, I think the analysis was these are some really good actors, you know. They're like, yeah. truly. They don't, they don't try to be anything else. They're there to entertain people. Right. It's all about getting the attention, whatever it takes to draw an audience. Uh, Andy Kaufman. Do you, you remember Andy Kaufman, the comedian? I don't know. Um, Latka on uh, Taxi? No? No. Okay. He, um, he got involved with uh, wrestling, and he was uh, wrestling women, professional women wrestlers, and uh, he got into a fight on Johnny Carson with somebody. He actually broke his neck, I think, uh, or broke a cracked a vertebra in his neck um but he was taking on that whole industry and exposing it as entertainment which is what it always was i don't know why i talked about it i, I like andy kaufman but <laughs> i had to look up his his stuff andy kaufman yeah he, well here's he did some really innovative comedy um, a lot of people didn't like it. He had a comedy special on broadcast, one of the main three networks back in, it was probably in the early 70s. And, you know, back then, TVs had the vertical hold and the horizontal hold, and you would have to adjust it periodically. Yeah, exactly. He artificially introduced a vertical hold leak so that the screen would roll. Uh -huh. in the, so you could, there was no way to fix it. He did that on purpose. So... He thought it was hilarious, right? But people got really, really annoyed with him and did not like his, his comedy. Um, he did a show at Carnegie Hall, and he read um, one of F. Scott Fitzgerald's novels. He just, he got in there, he's on stage, he's got his microphone, his, his stool, his little coffee table, and a, a glass of water or a bottle of water, and he just started reading a book. And that's what he did for like five and a half hours. And it was only a handful of people that stayed till the end. Another time at Carnegie Hall, at the end of his performance, he invited everybody out into the street for cookies and milk. He had brought in like early food trucks and had them all baking chocolate chip cookies and had fresh milk for everybody that was at the show. Now, it was real interactive. It was unexpected. And he just wanted to see pe what people would do about it, you know, how they would react. So, yeah, he's, uh, he died of cancer, but that's a different story. There's a movie about him. You could watch the movie and learn quite a bit about him. I have to, uh, when did it come out? Well, quite a while ago. Jim Carrey played, uh, played Andy Kaufman in the movie. I can't remember the name of the movie right now. Let me just uh, make a note for myself. Well, um, Pete, if it was safe and affordable, uh, would you have an interest in going into space? If it was safe and affordable, and uh, maybe I wouldn't feel like the experience was wasted on me because I'm older in years, then uh, maybe somebody younger would have more 
um, more life experience and ability to share that experience with other people and get them excited about it. I think at, at this point in my life, yes, I would do it, but I think there are other people that would benefit society more by doing it. And how safe would it need to be? Well, uh, I think the same probably as airplanes. Uh, you know, I don't know exactly what that statistic is, but if I was looking for a benchmark, I would say about the same as an airplane. And uh, do you still play racquetball? I haven't played racquetball in quite a while, but I have been playing chess consistently. I was just remembering our times playing racquetball at the Y over here. And yeah, I has uh, changed quite a bit. It has. I was just thinking about playing racquetball in space, maybe having Velcro on your feet and be on the... Uh, I don't know how that would work. You know, the mobility, uh, if you're in zero G, you know, you can just push yourself off the wall, but you'd have to be pushing pretty fast to get to where the ball is going to be. Well, and on top of that, when you swing the ball, you swing back. That's right. <laughs> it would have a whole new set of challenges. Um, yeah. yeah. You remember, well, I, on, oh. on a different topic, do you remember Gary Novosel? I don't. Uh, he worked on the same team as I did uh, at Compaq. Uh, when I first started, I worked in the Documentum uh, infrastructure group, and uh, he was he was in that same group with me. Uh, he passed away recently, and I didn't know if you knew him. I, I tried to uh, tell everybody that I that I knew for sure had experienced him at Compaq. Uh, I didn't remember if you did knew him. No. No, I, I think we, you and I only worked together uh, briefly whenever we were both out at Cyprus. Yeah, when I was providing infrastructure support for the online stores. Exactly, yeah. Uh, I haven't seen, I used to see Kim Hoffpower from time to time at church, but I haven't seen him in quite a while. I ran into uh, Eddie Schaefer, it's got to be two years ago now. Um, Tammy Millett used to live in the next much more expensive section of Longwood than I live in, but uh, I don't even know if she still lives there. I think she's retired now. She is. She is. Mm -hmm. So I don't know if she still lives here or not. I used to see her in her, her 1980s vintage Jaguar going up and down our street <laughs> every once in a while. Um, Kim Crone, I think, passed away. You remember Kim, right? I do remember Kim, yeah. Somebody told me that she's passed away. I don't know that for personal knowledge, but uh, who else Who else was in those groups? Well, we got like Jeff Eby and um, Stephanie Arnold and... Um, well, I, I don't know where John, and, John Arnold and Stephanie Arnold are anymore. Um, they used to live here in Longwood as well. But uh, he was doing some like mechanical um, construction company after he left HP. And I don't I think he's, I think they've moved away. I don't know where they are. Um, I do follow Jeff Eby on Facebook. I like his uh, three positive things a day post that he does most of the time. Yeah, me too. I, I think that is a really good uh, example to follow. Yeah. Yeah. Before more on, what's good uh, and how much more we're alike than different, I think we'd have a much happier world. Yeah, uh, for sure. I mean, it looks like, you know, the news media is, is looking for the worst things that have happened in the world to put in front of us, as opposed to holding up the best examples. Right. And I mean, and it's amazing, regardless of how bad things are here. I mean, you're able to walk outside without worry about, you know, a missile killing you or, yeah. uh, you know, you, there's just food at the grocery store. Um, so, I mean, yeah. so how do you think the, the country is handling the coronavirus crisis? Do you think we're doing a reasonably good job or? We could have done better. 
Well, it's funny, you know, we talk about uh, landing on the moon and how that'd be like the event that brings us together. But I think based upon my last 150 interviews, I would say most people wouldn't even know about that. But this coronavirus is a nice stand-in thing. It really has sort of put us all on the same page. Uh, so there's kind of that. In terms of how we're handling as a country, I think we're doing a really horrible job. Uh, I think there's so much misinformation out there and who's doing what and what the real threat is. And it also feels like that we're making decisions out of impatience as opposed to really, um, you know, I mean, like I don't see what is different about now than there was at the beginning of March. And so I feel like we've pretty much set ourselves up for guaranteeing political unrest that will be of one of two flavors. Either uh, in both of them, uh, everybody gets exposed to Corona. Um, the, f the first one is, everybody gets exposed to Corona and it doesn't really affect most people. A few people get mildly ill and maybe even a few people more die, but it's like, why do we have the lockdown? And then option number two is um, where you start having pile uh, bodies piling up. So it feels like we're pretty much guaranteed to have one of those two uh, things happen, I think. So historical precedent, the Spanish flu in 1918, um, that lasted two years and killed uh, 20 million people worldwide. Uh, I think it was a number out of what 4.2 4.2 billion that lived at that time. Um, it there was no opportunity for the mass communications that happen now. I'm sure there was still miscommunication but there was not general sheltering in place. There wasn't restrictions on travel because travel wasn't like it is today. Um, you know, the steamship still operated, but it took, oh, what, what it took two weeks to cross the Atlantic at that time? Uh, and by the time you arrived, either you have a, um, a ship full of sick people or you have a ship full of well people. Right. And so. I don't know. I, I just, you know, people keep citing, look back to 1918 and how many people died, but today we have a better healthcare system. As flawed as it is, it's still better than it was in 1918. Uh, our lifespan is longer. We have a more active and healthy population. Um, I don't know for sure myself what, what, could have been done differently. Should they have closed the borders sooner, uh, restricted travel from certain parts of the world, or just shut everything down? Uh, is this just a U.S. issue? I don't think so, because Italy was a lot worse than we were at the beginning, right? So. And I think if it wasn't for Northern Italy, uh, where you had those graphic scenes of bodies staying in places and lots of people dying and hiding, I don't I think without Northern Italy, we would have not had a lockdown at all. You think that's true? I mean, it just feels like Northern Italy was like the thing, oh my gosh, look at what's happening there type of situation. Yeah. I don't know. I don't think we've done a great job with coronavirus. It has nothing to do with the space program. But, you know, if we were in space right now, I probably wouldn't be worried about coronavirus up there. <laughs> Until you have uh, two astronauts from Earth to come and visit you later this month. Yeah, well, hopefully they've been uh, in the preparatory quarantine for enough time to be diagnosed whether or not they're carriers or not. And, you know, some people have talked about maybe this is the engineer virus that got out and all that thing. I think that's kind of irrelevant, but considering where we are in terms of being able to create such things, I mean, you got to imagine there's military minds and terrorist minds and what have you that are looking at this and going, whoa, <laughs> look at what we could do. Yeah, so my, my thinking on that is you see in all of these shows about these bioterrorism weapons, if the technology was really as readily available as they portray it in the fictional media, um, somebody would have used it by now. And yes, chemical weapons have been used in parts of the world 
since World War One, right? Mustard gas has been around for 100 years. So we have used these horrible weapons in the past, but they haven't been engineered bioweapons. They've been chemical in nature and not viral or bacterial in nature. Uh, if it, I really do believe if it was as readily available as they portray it in uh, movies and television, it would have been used by now. But, you know, our technology is increasing. Um, com computational power wasn't readily available 50 years ago, but now you could get pretty much unlimited without, you know, for anybody. And I'm on the call. My wife wondering, <laughs> wondering something. Yeah, I understand. Maybe, maybe she'd be open to being interviewed at some point. Uh, anyway. My, but she's not, she's a pretty private person. Yeah, I've had a few people that I, I know very well, and I'm like, hey, can I interview for this? And like, uh, no, not me. And it's just like, but I, like, why not? I mean, it's not like this, like, nobody knows we're going to the moon in 2024. You think they're going to be looking at your interview? <laughs> so. <laughs> yeah. So. Fear of, fear of uh, exposure, I guess. Exactly. Uh, they're they're afraid of uh, their their friends and family seeing it. Uh, not so much the the mass uh, mass people. Yeah. Well, uh, thank you so much for your time. Uh, did you have any like additional thoughts in closing? I do not at this point. <laughs> okay. <laughs> well, thank you so much, Pete. It's good talking to you, Nathan. Take care. Bye.